I mean, it's just nonstop physical grueling exercise, constantly moving. I mean, you're averaging uh, nine miles a day just to eat. Just That's running, it. And just running. Just, just running to go eat. And then in Hell Week, it's... Um, you eat four times four times in hell week so that's 12 miles just to go eat just in hell week so it's constant moving constant uh struggle constant being cold constant miserable and there's one thing about first phase is simply this is you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable that's it there are no comforts it's like you <laughs> there is zero comforts so and that's what we want to mentally break you down because war is hard you don't get any comforts at war you don't you don't get to sit back and do what you want to do and relax it's, it's gonna be difficult and we got to make sure you have the you have the uh mental capacity to, to deal with discomfort and make discomfort comfortable for you that you can maintain and, and sur have a survivability and actually have a strong mindset to complete the task at hand while being miserable and that's what it's for My guest today is retired Navy SEAL and professional photographer Darren McBurnett, or McBee. McBee is the author of Uncommon Grit, a fine art photography book of the journey through Navy SEAL Bud's first phase training. It's a unique look at the military's toughest training from the point of view of someone who has lived it. McBee includes descriptions of evolutions, which gives the reader a glimpse of what it's like to train to become a Navy SEAL. Uncommon Grit is one of the few books that has the testimonial from Admiral William H. McRaven, U.S. Navy SEAL, retired, who wrote, If you want to know what SEAL training is all about, this book is for you. McBee also started a nonprofit organization on CommonGridFoundation.org, where he raises money to help vets and first responders and their families deal with funeral costs, living expenses, health care bills, and other expenses. Their focus is on raising awareness, increasing community support, and finding ways that can assist those who answer the call, keep us safe, and provide us the freedoms we enjoy. I recently sat down with McBee to talk about his incredible 24-year SEAL career, photography, and leadership lessons from his SEAL experience. Darren McBurnett, McBee, thanks so much. It's really an honor and a privilege to have you on the show today. I want to tell you, I was up really early this morning, like excited about this. I have several interviews over the past couple of days, and you were the one that got me up early in the morning and a little anxiety. I never spoke one-on-one -on -one with the Navy SEAL, especially someone 24-year-old, 24-year veteran, 24 years that you did. I don't want to stop reading this resume because it's ridiculous. Basically, you've done everything dealing with the Navy SEALs. You spent two years in the Middle East on deployment, combat, parachute, jump, eh, enough, enough. But today, <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about this book. This book is amazing. Uncommon Grit. Thank you. Uh, a Thank photographic you. journey through the Navy SEAL training. McBee, welcome to the show, brother. Well, thank you so much, uh, Charles. It's a, it's an honor. It always is, and it's a privilege. And I'm so glad you reached out. And uh, uh, it's, it's, it's just so nice to, uh, to see people, and especially person of your caliber. By the way, I looked you up too, so, <laughs> and all the wonderful, awesome things you have done. I wish I would have known you 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so you've done reconnaissance but, uh, on me. You have basically uh, yeah. I'm dealing with a 24, oh, 24 year old, yeah. bit, right? Okay. <laughs> But uh, but thank you so much. It's an honor to be here, and uh, and you know it's you know life's life's interesting journey. You know you whatever uh, whatever uh, highway you're on, you're gonna take some detours. And you never know where those are gonna go. And then mine mine ended up in the SEAL team, so um, it's been a, it's been quite the journey. Yeah. So thank you for having me on the show. Oh man, R literally my honor, brother. I want to tell you about this book first. First of all, those of you who are listening, you got to get this book, Uncommon Grit. It's a coffee table book. It's a photography book, and Mick, McBee is not only an amazing military man, hero, member of the Navy SEALs, he's an amazingly talented photographer. He was granted access to the Bud's training, which I'm going to let him talk about in a second, and takes us on a photographic journey of what it's like to go through all the evolutions these candidates have to go through to become a Navy SEAL. We'll get right into that in a second. So, McBee, first of all, how does someone like you, do you wake up one morning and say, I have photographic talent, and let me take a camera and start taking pictures? 
How did that develop? Um, you know, it's, uh, well, I've always been into art. Okay. So if I didn't go into the Navy or college, I'm probably working at a comic book store or probably working for a comic book or something like that. I'm pretty sure. Or CGI. I mean, that's, that's what I love. Even in sixth grade, I'd be sitting there at the dining room table, you know, drawing, you know, Dungeons and Dragons figures, you know, so that, that was me as an artist. I always knew I've been an artist, but just kind of figure out what, 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 uh, what avenue that, that would lead. And, um, so as, you know, went to college and I always gravitated toward the arts, you know, especially a uh, visual arts, uh, cinematic arts, uh, just artists in general museums. I just loved, uh, the creativity that, uh, that, that human nature has, and it's always been part of me, but I'd never really cultivated exactly what that was going to be for me, you know? And, uh, you know, I joined the Navy out of college, you know, just, you know, I had a family history of being in the military and that's what I knew I wanted to do and nothing really, I didn't take history of art as a degree or anything like that. I just kind of just moved on with a humanities degree, which is basically a liberal arts degree, which means when you graduate with a liberal arts degree, you know a little bit about everything, but not enough about anything to do anything important. And I was in debt and needed a job and I was broke. <laughs> so, uh, but you didn't join the military. Uh, but that, that, that manifestation of that artist in me came through uh, probably about my th- 13th year in the, in the Navy as I became a Navy SEAL. Uh, did a bunch of combat deployments from Iraq to Afghanistan to Liberia uh, and just started doing teaching military free fall. And uh, I just remember that iconic scene in my head is like five o'clock in the morning, the C-130 of the airplane, the ramp opens up, the sunlight comes in through the ramp. And I got all these students that are about ready to jump for 16,000 feet to learn military free fall because you that's uh, one of our insertion platforms. And I was an instructor and I was a video guy. So you can't learn anything when you free fall without seeing yourself on video. So it's a, a learning tool. And I became really good at military free fall, which was kind of weird, but I naturally was good at it. And, um, and I remember looking out there one day, I had my student who was terrified. I'm like, look, look at that beautiful sunset coming, that beautiful sunrise coming from the mountains. It's 16,000 feet. The ramp is open. We're going to jump. And he's looking at me scared. And I'm like, and we get paid for this. Let's go, you know, <laughs> tap him. He jumps out. And, and, and in my head, it's like, I literally wanted to do take it. I wanted that scene in my head. And I'm all thinking, I think about, it, I was like, well, I should take a picture of that. And then uh, that started my journey with photography. You know, it's like, well, I, I really want to take a picture of this. I don't know how I do that. And so, you know, this is um, 2007 at this point. And, uh, you know, I didn't know anything about photography, you know, that, but I know I wanted that scene. I wanted that capture scene on my wall. And, uh, and that's what started the journey. Wow. Outstanding. Outstanding came out with this book. But I, I want to talk about the book in just a few minutes. Because mm-hmm. first, I never had the honor and privilege of sitting down with an Navy SEAL. And there were so many questions I've had uh, uh, about them because I don't think you guys are human. You definitely are a, <laughs> the, the Navy figured out a way to get superhumans amongst us uh, and, and, and call them SEALs. <laughs> so my first question is this. Any branch of the service can apply to become a Navy SEAL. Is that more or less right? Uh, you can. It's a lot tougher when you go through another branch. Um, like, let's say you went to the Marine Corps. I'll, actually, we have a a small number, but actually more successful number of guys that go through the Marine Corps first, get down with the Marines, and then cross rate over to or cross service over to the Navy to become SEALs. Um, it can be done, but it's a difficult route. Uh, the good news is you've already got four, eight years of military experience under your belt. The bad news is you have to to cross cross service transfer and then either start at a lower rank and then move on. And so that's kind of hard on people. But uh, for the most part, it it can happen, but it's not as successful as individuals just joining the Navy right off the bat and then uh, and then you know applying for the candidacy to become a Navy SEAL. How difficult is it to be a Navy SEAL? Is my first First thing I have to know. And second thing is, why does one want to become a Navy SEAL? Uh, that's, that's two great questions. Uh, 
number one is I think that there's, there's two site types of people out there that become Navy SEALs. The, the ones that I've, the, the first ones that I fall in the category is not knowing what the hell they were or two people that know who they were and they, they train their whole high school and most, you know, their uh, adolescent lives trying to become a Navy SEAL because of what they've heard or read and decided that they wanted to be an elite human being on earth. And that was a path. You know, I was, I was just a, 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 a voracious high school athlete. Uh, that's where my work ethic came from. You know, I started in seventh grade running track, you know, in my high school career, I ran track, I ran cross country, indoor track. I was swim team. Uh, I did the Boston marathon, Cape Cod marathon. I did my first Ironman when I was 17, I did biathlons, triathlons, and that was my whole life was just running, swimming and cycling because that's what I wanted to do. And of course I worked at the stop and shop McDonald's to pay for money. And I had this old beat up clunker that was falling apart every time I drove, but that, that was what I wanted to do. That's what I thought in my head made a difference in my life was, was competing. And then, um, and so that was who I was, you know, when I joined the Navy, cause my, my, uh, physical readiness scores were so, so good, except for my push up sit-ups and, uh, and pull-ups cause I never did strength. All I did was like, you know, this is back in the air in the eighties where it was like, Hey, if you want to be a runner, you got to run a long way. You want to be a cyclist. Then you cycle thousands of miles. You want to be a swimmer. Right. No, yeah, no, no strength training, yeah. strength training was never Zero. included in any of that stuff. Right? Nope. It was all distance, 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 and sprints. And that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So, and cardio, uh, a lot of cardio. Yeah. Only cardio. Yes, exactly. So I'm doing like these, my, you had to do a 500 meter swim side stroke in like 12 and a half minutes. And I did it in five and a half, you know, and, and they're like, whoa, 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 whoa what are you, you know, I'm like, oh, this is what I'd like to do. And so I'm in the Navy and I was a medic in the Navy or a corpsman, what's they're called. And uh, I just got called into my career counselor office, which we all have. I know it sounds kind of like in high school and college, but you do have a career counselor. That's their job is to make sure they place you where the Navy can best utilize you and you can uh, best benefit the Navy, you know? And so it's a two ways. That's what I like about the Navy. It's like, they're not just going to make you go do something. They, they find your talent and utilize that talent to benefit you and the Navy. And that's what makes them good. You know, and they say, Hey, we got a job for that. We got a, a program is called Navy SEALs. And I was, and of course I giggled a little bit. I'm like, <laughs> that just sounds kind of funny. And you know, I don't know what that was. You know, I thought this little seal running around, you know, they said, and I was like, what do they do? And they said, they, um, they swim all day and scuba dive. And so for me, I'm like, Phew. I mean, think about it. If someone said, so automatically I'm thinking about swimming in the pools and doing water polo and all those things. It's like, uh, I've been doing that for years. That's easy. And then scuba dive, of course you think of like Bahamas, Nassau, you know, beautiful water, women in bikinis, scuba diving. I'm like, Oh man, sign me up. So that's, so I, that's, that's how I got there. And uh, of course, when I got to basic underwater demolition SEAL training, and then I find out later that is the hardest military, military training that we have 90, more than 95, when you get to the end state of becoming a SEAL, about 95% of everybody you started with was average of 180 people will be quit or gone by then. You know, I, I didn't know any of that. I just wanted to swim and scuba dive. So uh, I was, I was, I was hit with a reality check when I walked to the front door and I was welcome to the hardest military training, you know, in the country. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, Oh, um, wow. That wasn't in the brochure. My career counselor didn't say anything about that. <laughs> so B Bud's training is stands for Bud's Bud's stands for basic, basic unwanted. Yeah. Basic unwanted, basic unwanted demolition seal training. So our school. So butts. Okay. So if, so to become a Navy SEAL, the first step is you have to go through BUDS. Right? Yes. So you don't, you don't become a Navy SEAL day one. You have to earn that position. Yeah. It's about two, it's about two and a half year process. Two and a half years to become an official Navy SEAL. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the first step is BUDS. How long is BUDS? BUDS is six months. And it was broken down into three phases. The, the biggest phase that is probably the most sensationalized phase is first phase, which is basic conditioning. It's uh, uh, it's eight weeks, and uh, it's all basic conditioning. It's like basically we're going to break you down uh, physically, and we're going to see how hard you can go. We can see how far you can go. We can see how cold we can get you. Basically, first phase is we're going to um, put you through so many physical tests 
and we want you to we want you to quit. Okay, we're not going to torture you. We're just we want to make you quit. We want to see how far you can mentally go. And of course, with that is Hell Week, which is five and a half days of um, everything you do during the day, but you can do it at night too. And that's like the big crux exercise uh, in first phase is Hell Week, where you'll do five and a half days of everything you do in the day and at night, uh, about three hour average of sleep. And usually by that time, you'll probably have already lost half your class. The average class starts about 180. Um, so wait, 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 so January 1, let's say you start with 180 guys standing on those flippers, uh, yep. all at attention, and mm-hmm. you have that big black lagoon creature there. <laughs> Look mm-hmm. in the book. You'll see what I'm talking about. It's a black lagoon yeah, yeah. <laughs> there, and uh, and the instructor is in front, and he's telling you basically that 95% of you guys will will ring that bell, and the bell is signifies you're out of the program. Yep, three you, rings you're you out. What's What's interesting about what you said is like that happens like that happens like way beforehand. That happens at at. Uh, at basic orientation, after you got to your contract to go to buds, they're all going to tell you this is going to happen on one one day. You're going to be standing on those fins at zero four in the morning, and you're going to be hitting the surf. You're going to be sandy, and then we're going to start. Where we're, your days are going to start at three o'clock in the morning. You're going to go to bed about eleven, and then in in, in four weeks you're going to go to uh, you're going to have hell week, and it's going to it's going to be conditioning runs, soft sand runs, the O course. Thousands of push-ups, grinder PT, thousands of push-ups, sit-ups, dips, running, hitting the surf. You got to run. You got to even run to your meals. Your meals is a, imagine taking 160 guys. You get done with a morning PT from like 04 to 06. You got to take 180 guys a mile and a half away, 10 minutes to eight mile and a half back to get ready for next evolution. It could be a two mile ocean swim. Get done with that. Go back run all the way, eat again, come back. That can be a, a small boat work, IBS work. It can be the O course. It can be another conditioning run. You can be working on the combat training tech, working on drown proofing, 50 meter water swim, swimming. I mean, it's just nonstop physical grueling exercise, constantly moving. I mean, you're averaging uh, nine miles a day just to eat. Just That's running. it. And just running. Just, just running to go eat. And then in hell week, it's, um, you eat four times, four times a day in hell week. So that's 12 miles just to go eat just in hell week. So it's constant moving, constant uh, struggle, constant being cold, constant miserable. And there's one thing about first phase is simply this is you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. That's it. There are no comforts. It's like you, <laughs> there is zero comforts. So, and that's what we want to mentally break you down because war is hard. You don't get any comforts at war. You don't, you don't get to sit back and do what you want to do and relax. It's, it's going to be difficult. And we got to make sure you have the, you have the uh, mental capacity to, to deal with discomfort and make discomfort comfortable for you that you can maintain and, and sur- have a survivability and actually have a strong mindset to complete the task at hand while being miserable. And that's what it's for. And so, yeah, you, you just, you know, average class starts about 180 guys. By the time you even get to hell week uh, on your, when I went through as my fifth week, you had less than half your class, you know, uh, nowadays the, um, uh, uh, the curriculum is fourth week and you still lose half your class. And then even when they get done with that, you'll lose guys injuries after that. And so um, but the average class starts about with 160, 180. And by the time you get through hell week, which is your fourth week, which is fourth week starts Sunday night and it's Friday afternoon. You may, the average class that you'll have at that point is that anywhere between 25 to 30. So, so you're going in there. <laughs> you, no, it just, it's just fascinating. You're going in. And as uncomfortable and terrible as it is, those first three weeks, they're telling you that fourth week is going to make this look like a cakewalk. Yeah, absolutely. And it gets in the guys' minds. They're like, I, they're like, even me, I was like, I can barely make it to the day. I can barely do pull-ups. You know, <laughs> what's what saved me was swimming. It's like, oh, thank God, there's the ocean, a two-mile ocean swim. Whew, I get which, swim which, which is freezing, which is freezing. Yeah, which is freezing, by the way. You're looking at, you know, it's well, probably people think of San Diego. It's like, oh, it's beautiful weather. It's like not if you're a sealed student. It's mm. miserable. Water is anywhere from 48 to 55. You're freezing all day long. You're shivering all day long, you know. But um, you know, but that that's what it's meant to be. It's like to challenge you, because you'll be amazed what your body can do if you just let it happen. You know, you know, if you want to do hard things, you got to do hard things. And um, and me being an athlete and doing all those things, it's like that was the drive that I already had, but I wasn't prepared for 
all the physical hard work that, that it was doing. I was like, wow. But I, uh, you know, every day was a different day. And then I had all these guys that had all these muscles and they looked like they belonged there. They had abs, you know, they just, <laughs> they were, they had bodies like Adonis's and they were doing all this stuff and they look, they were knocking all this stuff out. And I was struggling as I could swim and run and do the pool work, but the O course, the, uh, you know, the, the, the logs, the boats and everything. I was just, Oh man, I was, it was basically kicking my butt. Okay. So but, uh, I'm going to go through the evolutions for a second. Yeah. During those four. So really what you're doing here, and I want to talk to, to Mick, Mick, Mick be the instructor. Yeah. You're taking a recruit. You're taking a recruiter, a candidate. I'm sorry. You're taking a candidate and you are separating the physicality of it from the mental part. Yeah. Because if we shut off the mental part, your body can't handle most of the things you're doing here. Yeah. Your brain is telling you stop. Like when mm -hmm. sometimes when I used to work out, you know, my brain, ah, I can't deadlift that, but break yeah. that out and you can do it. Yeah. And you're, you're as an instructor, you're trying to break that in half and tell them you can do much more than your mind is telling you. you can. Right. Yeah. Is that what you're trying to do here? Yeah, you are trying to do that. But, if, but what you asked if I was like the instructor McBee, you know, telling the younger McBee, in which I figured out, was it's not about the individual, you know, it's about the team around you. And that's why SEALs and BUDS is broken up into boat crews. You get seven guys per boat crew. And that's why it's the SEAL teams. You know, it's not like, you know, it doesn't say it's United States Navy SEALs, you know, America's elite. It's like SEAL teams. That's emphasized for a reason because one of the basic reasons, one of the basic things you have to learn is um, you can't do it alone. No matter what, you cannot do it by yourself. And those of you that are there, the gray man or like kind of hiding out and, you know, and just hoping to get through each day without really interaction with the guys around you. And, and uh, you're, you're kind of self-centered and selfish, you know, you self-loathe, you're like, Oh, I don't want to be around. I just want to kind of get through this. They don't get it. It's like, once you understand that you, you start caring more about the guys next to you than yourself, that's when you start to get it because you don't want the guys next to you to fail. You don't want the guys next to you to have that log collapse in their heads and break their neck. You don't want those guys in that boat to be out there in the surf zone. And all of a sudden out of nowhere, mother nature throws 10 foot waves at you. And then your boat just gets tumbled, you know, and, and, and bad things happen. So you want to make sure that you, you do your best effort to make sure that they're taken care of and they can't do it without you giving your best effort. And, uh, and that's the trick and that's the key. And I tell that to people all the time. It's like, when you stop caring about yourself, your pathetic little self and start looking at the six guys next to you and they all need you and you need them. And they all look at you and you look at them. It's like, okay, we're going to make it this day. I'm done. You know, like, you know, being a little bitch and crying about myself and how much I suck. Let's make sure these guys can take care of it, do what I can do to get through this evolution. And once you do that, you, you start to get it. So, so you're taking all of the things which nature has programmed us, hardwired us in a sense, to care about our own preservation, to mm -hmm. care, to listen to our brain tell us, stop, you might overexert, go lie down and rest. And you're tearing them up and recreating or reprogramming my mind to be a totally different person four weeks later. You know, because the mission never ends. Whatever mission's out there, it's never going to end unless you make sure that it ends. And we need all of you to attack that mission and believe in it. And so, and that's the thing. It's like your body can break down. It's like, oh, we need to sleep now. It's like, nope. <laughs> well, have we achieved the objective? Nope. Well, then we got to keep going. Well, you know, and, and, that's and, all, and all the time you have instructors like yourself screaming at candidates, ring that bell and we'll put you all out of pain. You'll go back mm -hmm. to sleep. And yeah, so tell them. Yep. It's like, Hey, you can quit. Qu quitting's easy. You know, I mean, no one remembers people who quit, but it's like, you never know how far you, I always told, I always told students was this, like, you never know how far your potential can go unless you see your potential and then keep moving forward. Cause most people don't understand that. They don't understand that you, you are capable of doing so much more than what you think you can when you're given the right environment and, and, and injected it in you to keep, keep moving forward. And it's amazing. It really is. It, it, it's, it's just to see who it's, who's willing to keep moving forward when they physically can't, 
you know, and that's why so many people fail because so many pe people fail because they don't give themselves that opportunity to keep going, you know, which is a huge disservice to themselves. It's like you, your body is capable of so many different, it, it, it's, it's capable of so many things and it's capable of withstanding uh, so much punishment, but you're not letting it, you know, because in your mind, once you, once people get tired in their heads automatically, well, I have to stop. It's like, no, you have to keep going because that's what makes Navy SEALs elite. That's what makes us who we are. That's why we're uh, out there at the forefront where people want to be Navy SEALs for a reason. It's like, that's what we train to do. We train you to break down your own mental barriers, break down your, your own walls you've created for yourself, climb over those and, and uh, see what you can do. Because once you can do that, you can pretty much do a lot of things that you didn't think you can do. So did Candidate McBee ever want to ring that bell? Did you, were we have attempted to ring that bell? And, and, and Oh, and was... <laughs> heavens. Yes. <laughs> it's like, How man, what, was the, what was the closest time? The closest time you ever came where oh, I... you, you were inches away from doing it. What do you remember that point well, in time? I, you know, I'll be honest with you, Charles. I never was like inches away from it. It's like, Oh, it's right there. I want to ring it. But they're, but they're the people that are inches away from ringing it will ring it every time but there there are times where you're just like wow you know when you start to self-doubt you know you're just like wow i literally can't make it through this evolution you know but you keep moving forward you know uh, you're just sitting there in the surf zone it's freezing cold at two o'clock in the morning and you're just like wow and then you start thinking about how much stuff you got to do later it's like when you start thinking about the overall uh evolutions that you have that you know that are going to suck and be more painful, that's when it's hard. But instead of, uh, you just have to get into your mind and, and the mental war between your ears is simply, you know, okay, let's just do one evolution at a time. Let's make it through this evolution and whatever happens next, we'll deal with it, you know? And then you start doing that one day at a time thing, you know, one, one evolution at a time, one meal at a time, and then, then you can start break through it. But there are a lot that everybody does. Every student that has multiple times are like, wow, you know, and it's not that you're, you're quitting because, um, it's hard. You're, you're quitting because you just, you're, you're so exhausted and cold. It's like, I don't think I can physically do this anymore, you know? And, but then you just like, well, let's just make it to the next meal, you know, have ourselves all those Belgian waffles with, <laughs> it's funny because you, you eat and there's these huge buffets and it's like Belgian waffles and I take a Belgian waffle and I put peanut butter on there, slob of freaking jelly, another Belgian waffle, cold cut, sprinkle freaking Doritos and chips on top, you know, and put a bagel on there and, you know, and mashed potatoes and then throw a piece of chicken on the side, you know, and you eat that and then you get happy. And so I started thinking about, well, I'm going to make this evolution because I know they're going to feed me in two hours and then I'm going to look forward to eating. And so then you work with your guys like, Hey, we get to go eat soon, you know? <laughs> so it's so, things so basically like that. In, in life, you set these small little goals. Don't look at the big picture and worry about things that, you know, my, my son told me that uh, worry is the price we pay for things that might never come. <laughs> it was a yes. very expensive price to pay. Mm -hmm. uh, just focus on the job at hand one minute, get you to the next minute, get you to the next hour, get you the next day. Don't look at that whole big picture. It seems yeah. like that's what your that's your thought process here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Stop thinking about your own personal comforts. It's not about you at it's this time. It's not about you. You know, it's if, about if making I'm sure chafing, your body. If I'm chafing and I'm cold, stop bitching Oof. about it and think about what, what am I thinking about now? You're, you're thinking about making sure you and your six other guys can make it to make it through the evolution that you're doing because of purpose. You know, there's a purpose for that, you know, to keep going. And then when you stop and you go eat, you get your, you don't really rest, but your eating is your rest because you're standing up while you're eating. And then you go back, you know, it's like, and that's what you start focusing on. It's like, hey, let's, let's make it through this together, figure out what we need to do to survive and be, and be a team. And then you're literally counting on each other to keep moving forward because those are the, those are the basics. Those are the essentials that you need to move on, to get into the SEAL teams, to succeed. You know, just because you graduate a uh, hell week, the first phase, second phase, third phase and SEAL qualification training or SEAL tactical training in my time and do the workup, you have no guarantee that you can become a SEAL. It's like that. These are the, the, the steps to get there. An instructor of mine uh, and second phase you know, when we finally graduated Buds back in uh, 1996, 
you know, he came into our classroom and uh, he was our second phase instructor. He wasn't very well liked, but he was very, everything he told you was told you was matter of factly. And he came into us and he said, Hey, look, he goes, congratulations, gents. Good job in accomplishing nothing. <laughs> We're like, what? You know, he goes, what you have there in your hands is your graduation certificate. And what that is, is a ticket. It's a ticket to show up to a SEAL team and that's it. You have to prove yourself from then on out. You just basically got a ticket to show up, which most people don't get. So what you do with it's up to you. After two and a you half know? years of this mindset, you're no longer thinking, I think individual would be the worst possible thing that anyone could ever call you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, it's always been a team, you know? And uh, when you get there, you're a SEAL team. You, you're in platoon, you're a SEAL team platoon. You know, you all work together. And so, uh, and that's what makes, that's what separates us, you know, cause we understand that. So, um, and then you just move forward. If you're that's why for we're, that's why. We're, no, no, I'm sorry. That's why you're. That's why we're successful. You know, I mean, it's everything we, we have done. We've, we've failed along the way, but we learned from our failures and, uh, we keep moving on. And, uh, that's why, you know, you, anytime you hear, uh, the Navy SEAL, the, the term excellence, you know, comes into mind, you never quit come time. Um, you know, excellence is a standard for us. Um, uh, you know, mission completion, the guys that work together, the hardest training, the, the, the hardest training in the world, these guys have done it all. It's like, yeah, but, but there's a price for that. You know, the price you're going to pay for that. And that's the you know, defending our country the best uh, that we can, you know, and we all don't, all don't survive, but uh, we do the best we can what we got. So just to find these individuals, uh, to form them into a team, you have to go through a lot of people to get those, yeah. those handful. Mm -hmm. And it's funny is, is a lot of them you get are, uh, are, you get them all in the first five weeks of training, which is uh, uh, kind of fascinating, you know, because uh, pain, pain and cold is a, uh, is a great uh, teacher. It's, it's a great barrier. You know, the people that most people don't like, you know, it's like, I, I get asked all the time, well, how do I train to become a SEAL? It's like, do you go to the gym? It's like, yeah. Do you run? It's like, yeah, do you swim? Yeah. Okay. Do this. When it's two o'clock in the morning, I want you to go down to your lake or if you live your ocean, I want you to swim in an ocean. I want you to cover yourself with sand and then do a five mile ocean, five mile run in the sand in the middle of the night. And then every time you do a mile, you stop. I need you to do a, about 150 push-ups, roll around in sand, do sprints, go back to the ocean, sit in the ocean for 25 minutes, get back and then continue the run. You know, because people in their head have this comfort zone when they work out. They're going to go to the gym, run the treadmill, lift weights, and like, oh, I'm ready to go. It's like, no, that's that's nothing. You're you're conditioning your your muscles, but you're not conditioning your brain. Your brain, you're gonna we're gonna we're gonna make sure you're you're miserable while you're doing all this. Wow. So <laughs> how many evolutions are there? Uh, the, the main ones in first phase, uh, which is a basic conditioning phase, there's, there's a lot depending on what you're training for. The core evolutions is grinder PT. That's, by, that's your calisthenics. That's your hour and a half of calisthenics, which is push-ups, sit-ups, pull-ups, leg lever, star jumpies, burpees, you know, running to the surf and back. And that's your basic calisthenics. You get dropped doing push-ups pretty much every – Every time a instructor sees you do something wrong, the, your class is going to do 20 push-ups. You have to do them together. So mostly if you get dropped, you hear the word drop, you're going to do about 60, 80 push-ups. Uh, there's uh, conditioning runs in the sand, all soft sand runs. We have the obstacle course. Uh, we have two-mile ocean swims. We have four-mile timed runs, um, two-mile ocean swim timed. Uh, and then there's pool evolutions, for uh, acquiring, you know, what I like to call actively participating, saving your own life, like the 50 meter underwater swim, the drown proofing exercises, life saving, uh, underwater knot tying, you know, because those evolutions are to induce stress in the candidate. You know, it's like when you're under stress, you still have to be able to perform the task at hand. So, so, so you, see, you're, you're not, I gotta wrap my mind about this. This is, <laughs> this is just overwhelming because what you're doing here is you're just reprogramming all the things that our mind is there to help us and save us from. You're breaking mm -hmm. all of those things down. In times of stress, our amygdala wants to get us out of there, fight or flight, get the hell out. And you're basically, nope, enjoy it. Live with mm -hmm. it. Control it. Don't let it control you. Don't let the panic set in. Yep, control it and, and solve the problem. Solve the problem. Yeah.
Yeah. Why are you there? You know, that's the first thing with like under, underwater, not, underwater knot tying is one of the basic things that you, that you start in seal training, you know, and it's easy. You have to learn five knots, you know, it's like the bowl in the, 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 uh, the square knot, the clove hitch, you know, they're, they're easy knots, but you have to tread water for 15 minutes, uh, excuse me, uh, at the 15 foot of water. So you're, you're basically treading water. Your instructor's there because you're already tired from treading water and you got to go down. So you dive all the way down 15 feet and procedure. You tie the knot that they give you, which is like a square knot. You tie it on a, on a string down there. You give the okay. The instructor looks at it, make sure it's done correctly. He gives you an okay. You untie it. You get among the send to the surface. You go up, you catch your breath. You tread, tread water for another 30 seconds. And then you do the next knot, swim all the way down, make sure it's done correctly. If it's not done correctly, he'll do this over the knot. And then you untie it, you tie it back. And so you stop thinking about, you know, how much, how much your lungs are in pain and stinging because you need air, but it's like, I have to get this not done before I can go up, you know? And you so want to, you want to know something? So I'm, re I'm reading, you, first of all, you're a funny guy. Cause I'm, oh, I've read, thank you. <laughs> I read these evolutions here and I'm looking, I'm saying, Oh my gosh. I looked through all these evolutions because in your book, you have two mile ocean swim. And I want to tell you, I read some stuff on the Navy SEALs. I've never read anything put so well and from in a narrative perspective in an easy to understand with humor and, and with fighting sarcasm, just really well done. And I'm looking through all of them. There's not time. There's lots. I'm looking through which one could do you think maybe I could do? And I thought not time. <laughs> all right, swim. Yeah. But then you add a little crinkle to it. I just want to read this for a second. Uh, it's not like you're, it's not like you're tying a double winds or anything complicated, but somehow the instructor staff seems to spend an inordinate amount of time inspecting every turn, angle and twist on the thing. And while you're waiting, you start to feel your lungs burn because your last breath of air was a minute and a half ago. When the knot is finally inspected, you get an okay hand signal in return. You have a thumbs up. The instructor gives you a thumbs up, and then you ascend to the surface to continue to tread water and repeat the process. And it never seems... The instructor staff will always make it miserable for you. Yeah. Well, They'll always take their <laughs> Always take their sweet, sweet time sweet making time, that harder you know? and harder. Yeah, you'll be down there and you'll tie that knot. And then you just, you're like this. And then you look up and he's, you get thumbs up and he's nowhere around. And of course, you're in your fourth knot. Your lungs are already burning. He's not even come down yet. And you're like, oh my God, sweet Mary and Joseph and the shepherds. And so, <laughs> but then you got to dig deep. You're like, I got to hold. They'll come down. You don't expect it. Now, he, they don't want to see you panic. Panicking is like you do it, you undo it like real quick and you bolt to the surface. So you're like, all right, do nice and slow and give that and smile as you go up like it's no big deal. And then you get up like, <gasps> and then that, that, that's the trick. It's like, we never want you to get comfortable. You mean, yeah, you can do it, you know, but we're, we're going to push you everything, every little thing you do, we're going to push you just a little bit farther. And, and, and every time you keep making my comfort zone, just you keep taking everything I thought was supposed to be good and tearing it apart and telling me, you know, it's none of that. You're going to learn what uncomfortableness, pain is, and stress, and you're going to, this is your world. You, you know, created yep. a new, a new, a new uh, dimension for me. And it's called just yes, being, absolutely. Ugh. Yeah, you're right. You're right, Charles, because in the end state is war is hard. You don't get comforts. You know, you can, you can go to war and then you can come back dead. And so, we got to make sure that you are, you have mentally prepared yourself in every aspect of struggle, actively participate in saving your own life. Uh, make sure that we have pushed you to the point where, okay, I, I'm physically and ready and, and whatever comes at me, we can persevere, you know, you know and that's the point. There, there, I don't want to go through all the evolutions now, because definitely get the book, <laughs> look through them. I, I read them and I got, my body was stressed. Oh, uh, good. I'm glad you read them, though. Oh. That's a fun thing. People get this book and they like open up. Oh, McBee, I love the photos. It's like, oh, thank you. You're such an artist. Thank you. But I struggled writing that. Like, like I really, even when I was, you know, our first publisher was like, hey, we'll get a ghostwriter from you. I'm like, what the hell is a ghostwriter? Well, they write it for you. I was like, let me get this straight. Some dude with a, a journalism degree is going to know how to go through buds just when I tell him how it is. It's like, no, I'll tell them myself, my own quirky little things, how I'm a weirdo, and then I'll write it down. If people yeah. like it, they do. If they don't, they don't. But at least it's like genuine from me. Yeah. And so I, after a while, Charles, I just really enjoyed writing it. Like the photography has always been a passion, but 
writing has been a lot of fun. That was like, you know, I want to tell you when I got the book, the first instinct is I got to look at these pictures, but then I said, you know what? I'm not going to really appreciate them. And I'm only going to have one chance to look at them for the first time. So I want to really understand. I was so glad that you had a whole introduction of every evolution. So now when I turned to the page and I saw, you know, log physical exercise and I saw the look on these, I understood how much it weighed, what they have, what they had to do with it, what pain they were in. The picture took on a, a totally different dimension. Oh, good. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate that. <laughs> oh, man. it's a, Okay, so th there were two evolutions that jumped out at me that I just want you to spend a little time on explaining uh, and giving, giving some insight is, first, the log physical exercise. <laughs> How does any human come up with a way to torture someone with a 200-pound log? Explain that to me. Oh, I don't know. It's a good, also creative ways, Charles, that's for sure. But uh, the thing about the log, the log is, the, the log is basically, um, it's basically the team. It's kind of like, it's a SEAL team, but it's the United States is what it is. And it takes all seven of you to make sure we succeed at keeping this afloat. Keeping how, how, heavy, how heavy is this thing, McBee? How it's heavy 200. Is this? Yeah, it's 200, 200 pounds. pounds. So one guy starts lowering it down, man. Everyone's oh, yeah. gonna feel that. We're all gonna feel that. We're all gonna feel the pain of that. And and that's uh, that log is just a representation of the United States. It's a representation of representation of of what we do. And our job is to keep it afloat, keep it successful, keep it up, keep it running, keep it moving. And uh, once you give up or start collapsing and start can't hold up any longer, and and you let it fall, then you fail as a team. But uh, that's why so many special forces and so many and so all parts of the military use the log, you know, because it's because, you know, you're, you're running with it, you're handling it, you're doing maneuvers with it, a count bodybuilders with it holding over your head running with it. It's like that's, you know, this is your job as as a military person as as a uh, an operator as a warfighter for this country is that log is the country and then you got everything you do you got to make sure you take it with you. Uh, and make sure it doesn't fail, and that's your job. You guys have you to. You, you have to hold that log for. How, what is it? You live with that log. Uh, there, the, the, a lot, of, a lot of the uh, log evolutions. I mean, we have one that will, we uh, we call it the long mile, just for fun. But it's actually six mile sand run with that log. You know, so uh, <laughs> how do you? Where do you? How do you? What's the best? First of all, are you all the same height. Well, you'll yeah, we all the same height. We we break that down into height. It's oh. called a height line, you know. So after like literally, you're you're when you first get there, you're losing about twenty guys a day, easily. And so you you'll get out there and do log PT or, or boats, and all of a sudden there's like, hey, everybody line up by height, and then you stand next to you, right? You if that guy's taller, he goes here. If that guy's smaller, he mm. goes here. You line yourself up, and then start. And we use like. You know, we'll just go down the line from tallest one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Bam, your boat crew go. One, two, three, six, seven. Boom, you go, and uh, and you're constantly. So it's by height, and uh, like so many people quit, you just get to an evolution. Like so many people quit, you're like, okay, stop. Bam, line up. Bam, 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 bam. There's your new boat crew. Go. <laughs> wow. So so the log the the the, the log physical exercise. You have this two hundred pound log, and you ha it's teaching you teamwork. It's teaching you. Uh, um, really breaking down every pain barrier that you thought you had because I know lifting weights and stuff, when you hold something over your head, your shoulders give out. It's only two muscles holding things up with your shoulder. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's, you yeah. know, it's not a squat. <laughs> you know, it's not a deadlift. Yeah. It's two muscles. If you don't, so it's pain. It's a lot of pain. And you're holding yeah. this and you're running with this. Do you see a lot more candidates drop out at the, at yes. the, the log is the, is the differentiation. Huh? That's the. Yep. It's. It's the evolutions. Uh, the biggest, the biggest evolution that people quit and leave is uh, the log PT and IBS and play the boat small, because you have to run with a, an object, you know. And that's why I find, even as an instructor, so many people quit that. And I'm like, you know, if y'all work together, those evolutions are extraordinarily easy. You know, they really are. I mean, yeah, it's, it's painful, it's heavy, but and you're running soft sand, but you're all doing it together. You know, and once you guys understand how to work together, they're easy, but it's the ones that just, they can't work together. They can't get in step. They start to self-loathe. Mm. 
start breaking down the the boat comes up and down the log goes this out it goes eventually goes to the ground and they get frustrated then they start yelling at each other that's what it looked like wow. that's what we look for is like how's that internal breakdown going to happen how's the internal leadership going to deal with failure within their log you know and uh and for the most part uh, that's where you get a lot of the people that just quit well it is, is it's, it's brilliant how, how how you you set up two evolutions that weed out the individuals, the go, those mm. guys who are not teamwork players. It's without, yeah, you, you, it's just from a simple two hundred pound log and a, I don't know, an yeah. inflatable boat that weighs how much does the boat weigh? Yeah, the weight, the boat, ironically weighs another two hundred pounds. Two hundred well. pounds. Yeah. So uh, if if like I said, if you work together, it, they're easy evolutions. It's like I had uh, when I was in Hell Week, my boat crew, we we all got along great, and so we got the log PT. We're like it was nothing to us. We're like, thank mm. God, you know, <laughs> I was like, whoo, you know, this next two hours, this is going to be a cakewalk because we all got it. But this, but the boat, boat crews that don't, oof, well, you know, well, they, that's, that's they, so they end up going away real quick. Well, next thing is the next evolution, which freaked me out 100% because I I'm fearful of this is drowning and this drown proofing that you insane people do where describe what a candidate has to do for drown proofing. Okay. Drown proofing is, um, you know, like I said, it's panic proofing. It's your first real introduction to stress and uh, working through stress and uh, solving the problem. So drown proofing is you, we tie your hands behind your back. Uh, we tie your feet together. We throw you a nine foot of water. It takes about 20, 20 plus minutes evolution. You have to, Right off the bat, you have to swim 100 meters with your feet and hands tied. Wait, you know, like time, out, time out, time out, time <laughs> out. I, I don't practice first. You basically tie my hands and feet, and you throw me in nine feet of water and say, all right, first swim. You yep, have to figure laps, out how to do down that. And back. Yep, down and back. Yep. And so uh, at this point, you know, you've kind of turned it up to this point, but it's like when it actually happens, you know, when, when, we're, you know, when we're training up to that point, you don't have any ropes in your hands or your feet. You know, you know, you just you trying to try to keep them there. But once you actually get them tied, that change that changes you know, something in your head just starts to go a little quirky because now you're actually hands and feet are tied. Now you have to do it. So you swim now because I was a swimmer. I just had a breaststroke kick that I did with my knees. I just swam with my knees. I'm like, whoop, take a breath and go down. And you now it's you're, you're in control. You're in 100 yeah, percent control. Yeah. But a lot of guys don't. So you get done with that. You get to the side. You get back to the side. You push off. And it's, the next evolution is called bobbing. Now, bobbing is real simple. Wait, wait. Before you do that, one second, bro. When you are tying my feet and hands and I'm doing how many meters, you said? 100. That's 100 four laps. meters. One, yep. How many laps? Four. Four laps. A hot, wow. You have a 100-meter pool. Yeah. Okay. I'm figuring out how to make my body go without my legs and my, and, and my <laughs> arms. And... Figuring out how to breathe. So locomotion as well as breathing. Mm -hmm. Do you have uh, um, uh, instructors in the water in case these guys ingest a lot of water and start to drown? Yeah. Yeah, we got some. Yeah, we, 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 we got a place throughout. You can see. You know, it's they're, they're, they're easy to identify. They're the ones that are going right to the bottom. <laughs> so... I guess you have to have humor for all this, right? Yeah, so, you have to. Yeah, you have to. You have to have humor, man. So, so, so do you have guys who, who like these Midwestern guys who never saw an ocean or anything that don't know how to swim? Do they come into yeah. this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of them make it through, and, and there's a lot that don't, you know. And wow. so, wow, wow. Uh, it's just like, but it's how comfortable you can be in the water. That's the whole thing there, Charles. Is how comfortable you can be, and the bobbing portion is like. You know, you let all the air out of your lungs, you sink down nine feet, you push up with your feet on the bottom, all the way up, you take a big breath, and then you exhale as you go down. By the time you get down to the bottom, your air is out, you push back up. So actually it's controlled breathing. So it's kind of like, you know, you like let all your breath out, push off, get to the surface. When you hold your breath, you come down, you exhale a little bit little to the bottom, and you start to relax and you start to get your your uh you start to get the oxygen back in your in your system, you're starting to go, and then you'll float for uh five minutes and floating's easy. You just fill your lungs up with air, you're at the top, and instead of being on your back, you're like on your front, you take a breath of air, you just keep all the air in your lungs, and that's actually that's actually the easiest part of it. And then um 
After that, you go back to bobbing on your station and then you do a front flip, you back flip, you bob some more and then they throw your mask out at you. Then you go down and then you grab your mask with your mouth and you push up and then you say permission to come aside and you do. And But basically your hands and feet are tied, right? So what you learn, number one, it's not the paddock. Number two, you can actually problem solve without using your feet and uh, your hands in the, in the water as well. Just using, um, just using your lungs as as a ballast you know and so once you understand that it becomes quite simple and that's what we want you to understand we want you to understand that you can problem solve with what you got just because you don't have your hands or your feet don't think all of a sudden you can't do anything as long as you can you know think about it you know you know <laughs> you i want to it. tell you i and this is where my fear comes from but I, I i not no comparison and i mean no i'm not even trying to compare myself to this but there was one summer, we, vac- we summered down at the Jersey Shore, and one part of the beach has riptides, real mm-hmm. bad riptides. And a friend of mine, uh, we were both on our backs just floating out, and I'm not a strong swimmer. He's a very strong swimmer. We got out maybe three, 400 yards, and I looked because we passed the jetties. I realized, like, wow, we got to start swimming back in. As we started swimming back in, I realized I kept getting pushed further out. We were caught in a riptide. Mm-hmm. First thing I did was the most logical thing. I panicked. I was flat. I was like, a, <laughs> I said, holy smokes. And I started to panic more. And, you, you know, you're so right with this, how your mind just takes over. I saw him, and he was a strong swimmer. I said, gosh, if Ralph can't swim out of this, I'm dead. And I saw <laughs> him swimming as hard as he could, and I just gave up. And then my brain said, relax, you're going to drown. Just And I happened to reach towards the, there was a, uh, there was a, uh, a rope in the water separating, you know, the buoys they had mm-hmm. in there, full of seaweed. I just went hand over hand all the way. Finally got to the shore. Lifeguard says, yeah, if you went down again, we were going to rescue. You know, they usually don't like to, we don't yeah. like to go out there because usually when we go, save big guys like you, uh, we get yelled at. I go, guys, I was drowning. I was really drowning. But I, the panic kills, and that's what you're trying to overcome it, it yeah. every yeah, it does. You know, if you stop and think for a second, it's like, okay, all right, how can I get out of this? Let's think for a second, you know, stop panicking and thinking. Most people won't do that. Most people just go straight to panic. It's like, oh, I'm comfortable, straight to uncomfortable, straight to panic. There's no stopping in there to like, okay, how can I figure this out? You know, and if a lot of us did more of that, then, uh, you know, we'd probably be, um, you know, <laughs> a little bit better, but, um, you know, that's the way it goes. So, so when you when you speak to groups, you speak to businesses. Uh, this is not warfare, you know. We're in business; it's a different mm-hmm. type of warfare. But we're not going to drown. We're not going to die that moment. And every step of 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 budge training, man, you're a step away from really getting seriously injured or dead. <laughs> you know, it, it it's, it's no cakewalk. When you're in the business world, how do you take what you're talking about and all the training that you had, and as an instructor as well? How do you have people relate this to running a business or being a good student or being a good parent or husband or spouse? How how do you, how do you transfer that knowledge over? Yeah. You know, that's a great question. And I just break it down to a lot of components. You know, number one is whatever business you're in and you're in a leader position, people are looking to you, number one, and they're looking for you not to pan to look in you uh, uh, for comfort, looking to you for answers and how you're going to lead them and how you do that is, is, you know, number one, by not panicking, not stressing out. But, uh, you know, I tell them, remember who you are, master the basics, what you master the basic fundamentals of what you do to the point where you can do them instinctively, you know, um, always be prepared. Uh, the big thing to talk about is effective communication. It's like, look, don't go in and start going to the room, and start yelling and like, this thing's happening, this thing that happens. Like, they're not going to, they're not going to, they're not going to uh, be able to, to, to process that, you know, make sure you use effective communication, you know, um, you know, be a leader. If you're in charge of somebody, be that leader, you know, uh, you can't lead your people if you don't know your people and uh, their success is your success and your failures are their failures. And as I understand that, then it comes quite simple. It's like, let's get this job done right now. Okay. And this is how we're going to do it. We're going to do it together. And that's what I, uh, I talk about with a lot of businesses, you know, cause there's a lot of individual components of that business. And uh, I find that there's a big disconnect between the leaders, you know, and the people that are working, you know, and I'll use an example. I said, there's people that you're, there's a big disconnect between a leader and people working with you, uh, for you, 
number one, you got to break that barrier. They're not working for you. They're working with you. Do you understand that? You know, and so, and being a leader is a privilege. It's, it's not a right, you know, and if the, if the people that are working with you don't really like you or can't work with you, then the whole thing's going to fail. So it's a privilege and make sure you embrace that and understand that, that that's, if you have that objective, that mission objective, and you all agree to it and you all want that to happen, then you'll make it happen with all of you. And, uh, and what I found when I'm talking business, there's a lot of disconnect between all those pieces of the puzzle. And once you start aligning them and then you can start, uh, moving forward and understanding that you're better off all together instead of that one person or two people that have that ego and think it's all about them. And it's like, no, you're all in it together. You're a team, you know, cause you can't do it alone. Well, well, respond on, man. It's just amazing. Um, you know, before we go, I, I just want to. Oh, we're going. Speak. Oh man, I, this has yeah, been great. <laughs> I, I can speak for hours, man. My 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 my, you know, my um, studio guy here. He has to get home and see his kids sometime. Tonight, All right. So I can speak for hours, but let, let me just let me just touch on this because I, I find when I speak with guys like you and, and guys like uh, um, uh, Mark Geist, Oz of, of Thirteen Ooh. Hours, all nice, of yeah. you guys, all of you guys have foundations. It's like, it, you know, when you think about it for a second, from my perspective, it makes all the sense. Selfless people want to help other people. It, it just, it's not about you. And here you are, you created UncommonGritFoundation.org. Mm -hmm. Why did you create this? What do you, what do you try, what problem are you trying to solve? And, and how could the average, how could I get involved in this? Well, the Unc Uncommon Grit started with you know, the book Uncommon Grit. But uh, the biggest thing that it started, Charles, is simply this. It's, you know, you're never, you're never out of the fight, okay? Especially if you're an operator, war fire, a war fighter in, this, in, in, in our country. You know, I always tell people, you know, I'm, uh, I'm a father, I'm a husband, you know, operator, uh, war fighter, I'm an American. You know, and so uh, just because you're gone and retired doesn't mean you're, you stopped, you just came off the line. Okay. That's all you did. You came off the line and now you're backside support. You're still taking care of those who took care of you. Okay. And that's a big problem we have in our country nowadays is we have a huge uh, uh, shift of individuals in this country that think that they all did it by themselves. It's like, no, you know, there's a protection that's there from the military or first responders, police officers, firefighters, we're all there protecting you and you did not do it by yourself. We helped you. And we have families, you know, and they deserve to be taken care of just like anybody else. And for me, that was that was my take with Uncommon Grit because I look at Uncommon Grit and it's like, yes, it is very, very special. So let's do something special with it because you always want to give back to, to the first responder community, you know, and uh, like I said, we're just, well, all I did is come off the line. I'm still supporting these guys who are supporting me, still supporting the people that are supporting uh, America in the, in the front lines and how I can do it and how I could do it was with photography. You know, because I don't make excuses. I don't concentrate what I can't do. I concentrate what I can do. And if I can make a difference and help a family, a fallen service member, a fallen firefighter, a fallen police officer, and I can do it through photography, then that's what I'm supposed to do. Because I'm not on the line anymore. I'm off the line. But, hey, we're still shoot, moving, communicating. And we're still taking care of those that took care of us the best way they can. Because we're never out of the fight. You know, we just have a different role capacity. And so what, your, your foundation... It's, I think it's just you and your wife, right? Because yeah, it's just me and my wife. We have a couple board members and uh, all we do is, you know, we're going to spread the word of all the people who make sacrifices for our country. And then we're going to make sure they're taken care of where it's going to be. We, we raise uh, money for vetted charities that can go for people that come back with PTSD. Well, we don't have a PTSD foundation here, but we can do is we can give that money to Lone Survivor Foundation for Marcus Luttrell and make sure that they can take care of you. If there's a brilliant package, a police officer loses his life in the line of duty, we can give you, you know, we, we can't, we can't, you know, bring that life back. It's not going to make anything better, but we can do is like, this is what we can do. Here's 20, 25, $30,000 to help your family try to move forward, even though you can't recover from that. But this is us saying, thank you for what you're doing you know, and let us help you keep moving forward and do what we can to make sure that you're taken care of. So, so you're doing from, a great service. Aspects. You're doing a great service for me because you act like a clearinghouse and mm -hmm. you're getting my donation in whatever hands you feel yeah. is going to give most bank, let's investing, right? Paying, you know, getting, yeah, more exactly. value, getting more value than you're paying. We're going to have the biggest impact. 
across charities and foundations I will never hear of. I think one you were telling me about the other day was uh, with surfboards. Yeah, one more wave. The buddy of mine that I did one of my last SEAL platoons with, um, and uh, he, uh, Kyle Bucket is his name, he started a foundation out in California called One More Wave, and all they do is they build surfboards for amputees, PTSD, uh, uh, traumatic brain injury, for uh, police officers, for military personnel, special operators. And uh, the, all he does is takes money, surfs on the weekend, takes a day, and they'll go out there and surf for uh, surf water therapy, you know, and they build surfboards for them. It's like, hey, we, we gave them a $20,000 check, build surfboards, help these guys the best way you can. Because we're just another dog in the fight. There's lots of charities, you know, and believe it or not, there's so many good people out there that want to do some good, but they don't want to pick and choose. You know, it's like, well, do I have to pick this charity because they do scholarships? I'm going to pick this charity because they MBTs, this charity because they're wounded, this charity for this. It's like, no, hey, I'm just spreading the word. That's all I'm doing. It's like, hey, letting you know is I'm an advocate for everything that's out there for first responders and people that take care of us as Americans. And then we're going to put that to people that are that are doing the good. And then, you know, and and that's what we love to do. So, well, I, so I enjoy surf, it. The, the surfboard, for example, how much is a surfboard? <laughs> I think they're like 2,500 a piece. I like the really good ones. I know it's not 2,500 a piece. I'm sorry. I think it's like uh, uh, 250 bucks a piece, I think. 250 bucks. Uh, so yeah. so your, your buddy came up with an idea that for 250 bucks, you could change someone's life. Yeah. That's it. Here's a surfboard. Let's get out there and start having some fun. And it's how, like that community. How difficult was that? Not hard at all. And all it is is it, it goes back to to being a – Back in buds in the first couple weeks of training, you know, take care of those that took care of you. You know, once you start caring about other people and what they've gone through, and it's real freaking simple. You know what I was saying? It really is. The barriers to entry are so simple. We all have talents, whatever they might be. We all have special skills. Uh, This, I I took, I took some art classes and this one lady who gave me the classes, she goes, well, I can't give the class tomorrow because I'm going to uh, the VA and I'm teaching painting classes for the vets who were there and they look forward to it all week. And it really yeah. relieves a lot of their stress. This lady is not wealthy. Mm-hmm. Just taking those small talents. What a, what a country, what a, what a better community, what better everything. If just everyone took their small talents mm-hmm. and just applied them in a small way. You know, it's that one moment where you, where, when are you going to stop being selfish as, as society? When you stop thinking about yourself and like, Hey, there's other people out there that need you. You know what? The, the more we grow as, as, as society is human beings together. And it's like, Hey, we can do more together than we can as an individual, yeah. you know? And wow. so I'm just doing what I can do. And then I'm doing it through photography, you know? And, uh, and then I met great people like you, which is, I mean, just talking to you is an honor. Trust me. I looked you up. This is really freaking cool for me. I'm letting you know. So, I mean, and, and when you have great people that, that invest in great things and, and have that, that vision, it, you can do great things with it, especially when you, when, when you sync those people up, amazing things can happen. So uh, it's just such, such a privilege to be here, Charles. And I thank you so much. Yeah, well, uh, you're way too kind and the privilege is mine. And, 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 and really uh, I'm honored. I really am. Um, the name of the book is Uncommon Grit. Grab it, put it on your coffee table. I know it's in my house. It, this came right from my <laughs> coffee table. I left it there. And I just watch my kids, my wife, anyone who passes by, looks at it, just flipping through this. It just gives, and every time you look through this book, you know, there's a different perspective. There's a different, like, boy, you think you had a tough day, you know? And you look at some <laughs> of these things, like, gosh, these guys are going through this. I, I got, mm-hmm. what happened today yeah. to me? You know, I got a flat tire. Yeah. Boy, life, you know, first world problem. But yeah, that's and, it. The job, and the job gets harder. Once you get on the SEAL teams, it gets harder, but... I tell you, Charles, we got some couple prints I'm going to send you. You make sure you email me or ad- text me your address. We'll get those out for you. Oh, love it, and, man. Uh, <laughs> love it, love it. I, I, you know, we get, we're going to spread the word. So uh, it, I appreciate it. it. McBee, you are, you are the man. It was, it was great. Thank you so much for being on the show. The name of the book is Uncommon Grit. Uh, the name of the foundation, I'll put a link down in my podcast description, uncommongritfoundation.org. Uh, any donation, it doesn't matter if a dollar from a million no, people is phenomenal. $10 yeah. from, so don't think your, your number's too small. This man is taking it and he's putting it in the right places where as an investor, I'm always looking to invest a dollar to make 10. He's basically showing you a way and he takes a lot of the trouble out of it from my head. Mm-hmm. Where I give him the dollar and he's finding the biggest bang for the buck and, and that got to be a happy day for everyone. 
So, uh, Darren McBee, you are the man. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you, Charles. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for spreading the word. And I'm looking forward to a, a long, good lasting uh, friendship with you, brother. And Amen. looking forward to seeing you again, man. Same here. Same here. Thanks so much. You got it. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Charles Mizrahi Show. If you're a new listener, welcome. If you've been listening for a while, we're glad to have you back. Either way, we'd love to know what you think of the show. Please leave a review if you listen on Apple Podcasts. Reviews make it easier for others to find the show. You can also see the video of the interview on the Charles Mizrahi Show channel on YouTube.